Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, we thought the Flames may never lose again, and this week they won- They lost twice. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt to discuss everything Calgary Flames this week. And uh, Matt, look, before we get into anything else, why don't we talk about the three games this week? Yeah, sounds like a plan. The first game, the Calgary Flames uh, lost of the two and barely lost 4-3 against Dallas here in the Sal Dome on November 4th. And this was one where... Um, it, we took it overtime, and I thought the Flames... I don't know, I've always thought Dallas was kind of a pesky opponent for the Flames. They never seem to... when They never seem to really get an edge over Dallas, so it seems to be a pretty close game when we play them, and I thought this was a hard-fought game. What would you think of this one? Yeah, I thought it was fairly evenly matched, and it was just another instance where a bad play in overtime resulted in a goal against. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't say that was anyone's fault. It was just a bad play and cost us the game. Yeah, and in overtime, like the Flames controlled it for the vast majority of it. It was just the one turnover, bang, it's in the net. And, you know, unfortunately, Markstrom has not been very good in plays like that in overtime, but uh, it's just one of those things that the Flames need to tighten up over the course of the season. But I'm sure that with additional practice time that they'll address things like that nikita zadorov goes first goals of flame in this one uh with markstrom getting an assist and shillington getting an assist so guy i didn't know if we'd see on the board this year and he's already on the board yep and that was an uh, extremely impressive play by oliver shillington to take the puck up the ice and draw everybody to him allowing yeah, was- zadorov the clear lane to just walk in and fire it home no, you, you, for sure. It was. If you haven't seen the goal, you should go watch it. It's it's definitely worth watching that whole play unfold. Yeah, it's been a very long time since I've seen a Flames defenseman do anything like what Shillington did on that play. Maybe they should convert him to forward. Well, now you can see why I liked him that much. And, you know, shoehorn that offensive ability in somehow. Um. You know, if the Flames are going to lose a game like this, I would rather they lose it in OT, and I'm glad they got the loser point. I mean, we had almost no loser points last year. I think we had, what, two? Yeah, it's one of those things that it shows that the Flames are playing well enough where, like, even if they lose, they're right in it till the end. And, you know, they, they've they lost five games on the season, but three of them have been in overtime. And it's a small thing like that, but... You know, those kind of things add up over the course of a season, and you can't win all 82, but if you're still managing to get something out of games that don't quite go your way, then, you know, that's awesome. Well, for a team that was out of the playoffs last year by four points, those loser points we've found out can make or break your season. Exactly, and that's why a hot start to the year was imperative, and the Flames just need to find a way to keep the ball rolling. And they did just that. On the 6th of November, they kept the ball rolling as the New York Rangers came into Calgary to finish off our series. Coach Gerard Gallant at the end of this said he was glad they were done playing the Flames as we took a big 6 nothing win over the the Blue Shirts. And, you know, that goal by Matthew Kachuk at the end there, that was as close as you can get in the NHL to dunking on the opponent. Going between the legs? <laughs> yeah. Like, that was... He, there was absolutely no reason for him to do that. Other than, hey, we we respect you this little that I'm going to pull this in a 5 nothing game with, like, two minutes left, and you think, oh, well, you too bad for you. A, you think maybe there's a bet on the bench? Hey, Matty, if you can do this, we'll buy your dinner tonight. Yeah, probably. Something along those lines. And yeah, it's just, like, there, there was really no call at all for that other than let's just, you know, embarrass the other team because, huh... <laughs> That's I thought this one started out as a bit of a slugfest, and then Calgary easily took it over, I'd say, by about halfway through the first. Yeah, basically when Fox scored and it was waved off, I think that's when the game basically ended at that point. And, you know, when was the last time you saw fans care about Eastern Conference players? Like, when Fox did the whole Hulk Hogan thing, you can tell this guy's just trying to, you know, sort of become the, the heel here in Calgary. Yeah, and, you know, it's understandable. There's a lot of animosity between uh, Flames fans and Fox, considering the fact that he 
was a Flames draft pick and the fact that uh, he did not want to play here. And it's like, well, you know, you could be playing on a better team than the New York Rangers right now. But, you know, there's that. So. And of note, Brad Richardson gets his first goals of flame and first goal in the year. Yep, and I've liked his game since he's returned to the lineup. Just steady, he, yep. you know, does his job. Good veteran presence, knows it, his role. Exactly. And that's why, like, all of those veteran guys, whether it's Pitlick, Lewis, uh, Richardson, Goodbranson, even to a lesser extent, Zadorov, like, just their experience... On it playing, they just know how to play the game the right way. They go out, they play in their game, and that's it. And when I said, dude, the beginning of the year, I was okay with a lot of these signings for that reason. I'd rather have some of those depth spots filled with veteran guys who know what they're doing and know how to play in the NHL. Yeah, for sure. And they're all bigger players, and yeah, full marks on. Like I'd much rather having have those type of guys than the Dominic Simones and the. Uh, Josh Levos of the world on the third and fourth line. Yeah, or the sort of the Buddy Robinson AHL plugger who's the guy that we could get. Yeah, exactly. Well, the next game was a bit of a turning point for the Flames. This game ended the Flames' point streak at 10. Um, quite the point streak for the Flames, and they ended up losing 5-1 to a very depleted San Jose Sharks team. Not the result I was expecting in this one. Uh, it looked like it was going to go that way pretty much like at, at the second intermission. I'm like, they've had so many good scoring chances against Aiden Hill and they haven't just the one goal for Lucic. And it's like, uh, are you guys going to find that extra gear in the third? And basically once that goal went in to make it two to one, I'm like, yeah, the game's done at that point like the, the flames, the flames just, a great first or third yeah like they just uh it was the first game really this season that i saw them falling back into a lot of bad habits where yeah. like they're generated a lot of scoring chances they should have won but they got frustrated because they didn't get the success of beating the goalie a handful of times and then they just stopped doing the things that were necessary to actually beat the goalie and then empty netter and game over and it's their first regulation game since the uh night one of the season yep i thought like you said i think a lot of bad habits coming in here but i think also because of that a good learning game i think sometimes when you're on a roll you start to maybe take some shortcuts and maybe you know uh take some chances you shouldn't and sometimes i think you need those games sort of ground you and say you know what? We aren't invincible. We need these kind of games to reset, and and sometimes it's it's easier to listen to the coach after a loss and after a big win. Well, especially with the Sharks down seven guys due to COVID, it it would have been fairly easy, like if the Flames had continued to play their game throughout the full sixty minutes, they should have won that game. And that, that and do you think maybe the Flames came in underestimating the Sharks a little and bit? And that's exactly the point I was going to make, is that, it, you know, it's like, oh, we don't really need to worry too much about this opponent. We're not going to respect them. And then look at what happened. And something similar happened uh, on a uh, an episode that we uh, just did a couple weeks ago uh, when we beat Pittsburgh for nothing. Um, Toronto came into the... Uh, play the penguins a couple days before that and the penguins were out without crosby and malkin and the penguins ended up winning that one seven nothing and it was very much a similar style of game by the flames today or yesterday um that they just kind of took the sharks for granted that you know because of how many people were missing and you look at the names on the roster and it's like who are these people and you know it they just were a little too casual and i do not think that sutter is going to be too happy about that i think you're probably right 
Well, with that week of Flames games, that keeps the Flames in number two in the Pacific Division. We're currently at 17 points. Tied with, of all teams, the Anaheim Ducks, who I didn't expect to have a great season, and one point behind the Edmonton Oilers at 18 points. So the Flames now played 12 games. They're 7-2-3. and three. And Matt, some interesting stats on that. The Flames are 7-0 and oh against teams in the East, but have yet to beat a team in the West. They're 0-2-3 oh, and three against the West. Well, that... that- sets them up for a lot of success this season you know they play so many oh wait (laughs) yeah well the next seven games are against the east maybe we'll be 14 and oh by the time we're back in the dome oh that'd be good and uh, you know especially with the next three games they're playing montreal toronto and then ottawa Uh, two of those teams are two terrible hockey teams so calgary really does need to get on a roll again and get some and then there's the ottawa senators yeah Ah, uh, yeah, true enough. I need my rim shot sound effect. Yeah, but um, bum There you go. Um, so so that's where the Flames are now after twelve games. So, doing well, riding high, got seventeen points. Um, and if we look around the league, I mean, there's not many teams with more than seventeen points. We have Carolina with twenty, Florida with twenty-one, and those are, and Edmonton with eighteen. So we're we're doing pretty well overall in the league as well. That puts the Flames at uh, fifth in the league. So, um, when was the last time in tw- 12 games in that we were that high? I can think of a few seasons, but not many. Yeah, uh, it's more of an aberration than anything. And it, it's good to be ahead of the eight ball. It's just that the Flames are kind of in danger of getting a little complacent. And. You know, like they could easily slide back down into sub 500 territory if they're not careful. Uh, you know, like they're only two games up on 500. Well, let's talk about that. We know that there's going to be adversity coming. We know things can't keep going like this. We can't keep winning at this pace. We can't keep scoring at this pace. Um, there's going to be adversity. There's going to be setbacks. Where do you think the struggles are going to come? What do you think sort of the first cracks we're going to see are? Well, uh, you you're starting to see that. Um, like uh, with the offense, like if guys like Manjapane and Lindholm are not providing the scoring that they are or were at the beginning of the season, um, then you know guys like Adroka, Chuck, Monahan have to step up, and we're not really seeing any consistency with that. So if the Flames do not start to get some consistency from the offensive output from certain players then you know things could start to go awry rather quickly see for me i'll go in a different direction i think it's the goaltending i think we've seen some some cracks in markstrom's armor this week but if you look at the high danger chances and where the scoring chances are coming from the flames are giving up a lot of really good chances on their goaltender and i think that it's only a matter of time before Markstrom kind of, I don't want to say plateaus because he's a good goalie, but he sort of gets rid of his superhuman level and some of those start going in the net. Well, yeah, and it's hard for any goalie to basically be like superstar level every game. And like, while in the Rangers game, Markstrom I thought was at that like superstar caliber level uh, against the Rangers, you know, he was adequate against the Sharks and frankly they should have won that game even with him just being adequate and you know uh, the Flames just couldn't generate you know and it's one of those where Calgary needs to not just rely on the goalie bailing them out like they need to have everybody contributing and you know uh, that has been flagging at, at times yeah and that's number two for me is if we look at this lineup, we have the Goudreau, Lindholm, Kachuk line that we're really looking at for our offense. I would say that, that Coleman, Backlund, Pitlick line, it's like the 3M line from a few years ago, is not being relied on for offense, but is more being relied on as our shutdown line. Yeah. And a setup like line Kind three. of uh, like an energy-ish line as well yeah i mean they they're going out there if you look at their minutes against a lot of top lines and trying to shut those guys down and then leaving the third line in a good position Mm. which is lucic dubay and mangiapani i think those guys need to start scoring like a second line yeah i know and that's where i mean i would say the last couple games lucic has been the most productive on that line yeah 
Without question. And then you've got Richardson, Monahan, and Lewis. Here's an interesting uh, trial for you. Do you switch Dubé and Monahan? Do you put Dubé on line four, put Monahan with Lucic and Mangiapane? I could see that as a little bit of a experiment, at least for a Try couple to get games. Try Because yeah. Monahan at times has looked rather bad and disinterested, and then he looks like himself again. And but I'd probably be disinterested if I was on the fourth line of Sean Monahan too. True. Um. Yeah. So. You know, it it's hard when, like. I mean, I think I think from what we've seen from Monjapan in his career. So far, he really needs a good setup guy. Yeah. And I don't know Dubé's his setup guy. I don't think Lucic is his setup guy. So I'm thinking if you can put Monaghan there and sort of have Monaghan feed him, you might get Mangiapane going again. Yeah, and at that rate, I'd almost like to see Dubé with uh, Monaghan and Mangiapane and see how uh, that balance works as well, just because of the fact that the two wingers on that line would be quicker and I think that Lucic might be uh, dragging the other guys down a little bit in terms of the foot speed, although he has been better than he has been. My only worry with that is I would say the line of Mangiapane, Dubé, and Monaghan gets to be a bit of a soft line. And I think with du- with Lucic out there, you got somebody who can who can be the muscle. you got someone who can go in the corner and dig it out and do some of the dirty work that you don't want Mangiapane and Monaghan doing. True. And you don't want Dubé doing. Yeah. So that's why I like I, – I don't think Lucic has to be the fastest guy. I think you could have Monaghan and Dubé – or sorry, uh, yeah, Monaghan and – or sorry, Monaghan and Mangiapane. And even if you were to have them out there with like Zadorov and Good Branson, you've got enough puck movers in Zadorov, Good Branson, and Lucic so the other two guys can be your speed. Yeah. You know, and, and I think one of the issues since we have is we get too fast to guys the Flames. Everyone goes towards the net, and there's nobody sort of around the, uh, the hash marks to pick up some of those pucks. And I think – Lucic could be there to help sort of cycle that puck around. I could see that. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens there, but I just I don't think that Sean Monaghan as a fourth-line center is sustainable. No, and I think that he's there for a purpose, which is to improve his game overall. Um, Me too, like, but if it doesn't improve, i got to imagine the agent's going to be calling asking for him to, to get out of here soon. Yeah, and you look at... Um, like last game uh, uh, there was a couple of instances where he was actually engaging in puck battles along the boards and winning them so you know it's one of those where if he can incorporate that into his game more and be more assertive then I think that that'll reap a lot of rewards for him moving forward yeah and I think it's also it's not just you know I think it is there to get him to be more assertive and also to change his game a bit. I think Sean Monaghan has been a very one-dimensional player, Uh and I think they're putting him on that line. They're trying to get him going with a bit of a different dimension to his game. Yeah, and frankly, you know, like uh, as bluntly as it is, if the Flames, like, aren't able to get Monaghan into a realm where he is contributing in just more than the one way, you know that six and a half million dollars is very useful in other ways um you know expensive fourth line center yeah exactly and you know you can trade that asset uh and to a number of teams and well i think next year this team's just gonna need to shed some money to renew guys that we need to renew so yeah i think you're right i think that there's you know you might even just trade that for futures just to shed the cash yeah and you know it's one of those like ideally you'd keep him if he's producing but if he's not you know like you if you go and get the like five and a half six million dollar equivalent to uh uh, monahan on the ufa market like that's a very good player a good second third line center that, you know, is contributing your 20 goals and playing respectably at both ends of the ice. And, you know, as much as, like, everybody likes Monaghan, it's, you know, we have to actually try and win games. And if, you know, the player is not doing what's necessary, then it may be time to look elsewhere uh, not well, and you're talking about comp- you know you're talking about getting the comparable in the ufa market i think right now if you're looking for a serviceable fourth line center i mean you can bring glenn godan up into that role well even 
uh, Richardson, you know, like he was a sub yeah. one million dollar player playing the fourth line, and he does his job well. Like you don't need to be spending that much, and you know, it's one thing like if you're trying to teach Monahan, and that's fine as long as like this isn't a permanent thing. But if it's a permanent thing, then it's well, that's it. Know, I think you've kind of got to put a time on it, whether it's Christmas or some other time, the deadline, and say, hey, if this guy's not learning what he needs to be learning we're going to need to move on. Well, like, even then, it's like, do you trade Monaghan for a similar guy that's older, um, like, say, like, uh, Ryan Getzlaff, who's, you know, same dollar-ish, and, you know, like, all the particulars, but he's a decade older, you know, if you're not getting what you need out of Monaghan. And the only way I would do that is on a on a one year rental deal. True, because again, I think we need to sh- free up some money. So if you want to bring in a guy like that, and maybe you keep him on until the deadline for that reason. Oh but yeah. I think I think that they could use if we're trying to re-sign Johnny and Kachuk. Um, I think that they could use that cash next year. Oh, I agree. It's just one of those like you know, there are options if the Flames need to go in a different direction, and it's just. You know, you'd hope that Monaghan will turn it around, but, you know, with two goals on the power play and after, you know, uh, what, 13 games, 12 games, and not really looking that great aside from that, it's getting into the disconcerting stage. But I think it's also hard to look great when you're playing with Richardson and Lewis. True. Like, no offense to those guys, but the minutes are seen, and, and, you know, who's going to make him look great on that line? True. It's just, yeah, it it's just hard because you want more out of that person than what he's delivering right now. And, you know, like, it, frankly, like, he, his production level isn't looking out of line with Richardson or Pitlick or Lewis or, or, or. No, but we're also not expecting those guys to look great. So no. you're right. I mean, he looks he looks like those guys, but that's not who he needs to be. Mm-hmm. If we want to pay him, you know, a million bucks, sure he can be that guy. But at you know six plus, he needs to be higher in the lineup. Yeah, and he needs to start pl- playing better overall to earn that. Yeah, and I don't think playing better. What I'm trying to say, I guess, is I don't think playing better for him necessarily means putting more points in the board because then it's going to be hard with where he is in the lineup. But I think he just needs to be doing what he needs to do in that fourth line center role and needs to be more defensively responsible and sort of playing more of a an all around game. I think if you're looking for him to start breaking out with points, you're not going to do that with Richardson and Lewis on your wings. No. So we'll see. It's just. Uh... One of those things that we'll be keeping track of as the months go on and, you know, see how things unfold. And, you know, if we're, like, at game 40 or game 50 and there's been no change, that that's a lot different than if he's actually learned how to play a good two-way game by then and has resumed being in the upper half of the lineup, then, you know, that's obviously the ideal situation, but... You know, we have to just wait and see. And I think, too, we're fortunate because we can afford for him to be there. Like, obviously, the Flames are doing well. We can afford for him to take the time it takes for him to do that. And I think so often, if your team is not doing well, you're trying to put those top guys high in the lineup and maybe force them into those roles. Yeah, and how many times do you see a team overload, like, all their players, like, making it, like, a power play one unit out there well, and it's not many- work? And how many times have we seen the team when they were struggling going back to Johnny, Monty, and uh, Lindholm? Yeah. Right? So I think that that's – I think that the fact that we're willing to – and you're right, Monahan's getting a lot of power play time. Like, it's not like he's been banished to five minutes a night. But I think that we're sort of – we have that flexibility right now, I think, says a lot about this team and being able to grow some of those guys. Mm-hmm. And it's good on the Flames coaching staff to be the hard marker – when it comes to players like Monahan, where like if you're not doing what's necessary, then you're not playing. And I don't care if you're like the fourth highest paid player on the team. Oh well. Yeah, it's not about money. It's about what you're bringing on the ice. Yeah. And then the next question I want to ask you this week, and I'll give you my thoughts after, is we talked about the forwards. Um, 
with the stable play of Good Branson, I'd say I'd lock him in at number five right now if I look at our depth chart. And Zadorov, who looks like he's probably number six. What do you think it's going to take at this point for Valimaki to get back in the lineup? Impressive play during the morning skates and the pregame warm-ups uh, because of the fact that like he needs to show something. You know, like if you're not showing that extra effort level in the pre or the practices, then the coaching staff's like, well, why am I going to reward you with ice time when it actually matters? And you know, we we are not able to see that, and Flames fans aren't able to see that. But you'll see it when you see Valmaki draw back in, like barring injury, of course. Like if he draws back in, then he will you. You'll be able to easily know that, yeah, he's played well enough and shown the coaching staff that he's ready for another game and see how it goes from there. See, and I think it's going to take injury to one of those guys or, let's say, fatigue to one of those guys to get one of them out. And then it's about, I think, he's he's not just going to have to play well. I think he's going to have to find what's unique about him. Uh, to me, good Branson, Zadorov, they both got a unique flavor there that they bring to our defensive core. You've talked about Zadorov a lot, being similar to England and what he brings to our defensive core. And I think the question now is, with Shillington and Valimaki, I look at their games as being very similar. So I think Valley's going to have to sort of do what we were talking about with Sean Monaghan and maybe reinvent himself a little bit as a and show something that we don't have. Yeah, well, you saw with Shillington, like he didn't play a lot the last couple of years, but the team was working with him constantly on how to improve his defensive game, and like he didn't become he wasn't a very good offensive defenseman so he had to be a good defensive defenseman yeah and it's one of those things that he wasn't getting himself able to be in those positions to generate the offense because he was so lacking on the defensive side of it and now that he has got that tool of being a decent uh, better than average defensive defenseman that allows him the freedom to go up and join those rushes and bring that dynamic offensive flair that he's always had and able to actually showcase it because you know that if the play dies for whatever reason that he's able to get back into position and play responsibly instead of like oh well now it's a two on one or three on one the other way and we're screwed and i feel like valamaki He's very similar. I think he's got good puck moving abilities. He's got good vision. Yeah. But I think that he's trying to be too much of an offensive defenseman. And I think he's got good puck handling. I think sometimes he overplays that puck. And I don't know if it's just that he's young or if it's him trying to be sort of the quote unquote star defenseman. But I think he needs, like Shillington, to learn to be a better defense defensive defenseman. Yeah, and it sometimes it's learning the little things of like, do you go and confront that guy? Or do you ease off and allow him just some room to skate? And sometimes the better option is to just disengage from the guy and let him skate. And, you know, then you can re-engage at a later point. But, you know, it, otherwise you're getting yourself out of position and then the play can evolve into an odd man rush type scenario down low right in front of the goalie. And that's usually not a good thing. Well, another one I see a lot from young defensemen is holding the puck too long. They will hold it or pass it back and forth with their partner on the blue line, and they make one too many passes, or they hold it a little too long, and then it gets taken from them, or they can't move it. So I think that's part of it, too, is knowing, yeah. okay, I'm not here to necessarily shoot it up. I just got to move it to the guy, and when's the right so, time to do that? you, do you know, to... learn from Kenny Rogers, know when to hold it, know when to fold it. Exactly. I mean, you want to wait long enough to get the, you know, the forward to come chase you, but you've got to sort of find that sweet spot of when is long enough and when is too long. Yeah. Um, and, and that's one thing I've, I've found with them a lot too. And I, and I don't know if it is true, but I think that there's maybe been some of that, you know what, I'm the young hotshot defenseman, therefore maybe I should be, I, I deserve to be in the lineup. And I think that some of yeah. this might also be just a bit of a humbling experience. Yeah, and you saw with Shillington, like he barely played last year. And... You know, now he's arguably our best defenseman. Yeah, and it's one of those things where, you know, it it also sends a signal to the player that, you know, if do you actually even want to play in the NHL? You know, because 
like what you're doing is not working clearly so you know learn or you know we'll find somebody else and to his credit shillington has taken those lessons and been able to successfully apply them thus far well, how many times have you and i talked about shillington being a toss in on some sort of trade just to move the asset yeah well it, it it's because of the fact that like there was always potential there, but not no concrete signs of him stepping it up. And to his credit, he has. And Valimaki, I feel, is basically on the same timeline as Shillington, but like a year and a half before where he, you know, Shillington is now. And I think that you just similarly need to have him learn those lessons and hopefully he's responsive to learning those lessons because i i still see valimaki as being one of the top four defensemen on this team moving forward it's just that you know he needs to work on his game and it you know it's a work in progress valley's valley's the one guy this year i wish was not waiver eligible because i feel like he would be learning more right now anchoring a top pairing in Stockton than he is sitting on the bench eating popcorn with Michael Stone. Yeah, I agree. And, and I feel like and I feel like I have confidence in Stone as a seven if we need him. Mm. Oh, yeah, anytime Stone's needed, you can drop him in. You know what you're getting, and it's all good. Um, with Valimaki, though, like I feel that he just needs to be patient and learn and listen and learn and listen. And defensemen don't usually start getting good till they're 25, 26, 27 anyway. Valley's 23 and Shillington's 24. So, I mean, even if we look at, you know, him as a defenseman, like you said, I was going to say about 26, he's still got time to progress and mature. Yeah, and, you know, you also have to look at the fact like he missed a year and, like, all those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, there's still a lot of room with the, this player. Like, it's not... Uh, well, this is what he is, and that's that. There, you know, it's just hoping that uh, over the next while that he begins to take those next steps. But I wouldn't expect our, it anytime soon, though. Our whole core is very young. I'm just looking at this. Hannafin's 24, which is crazy to me. Is that young? Anderson is 25. Uh, Tanev's the oldest guy at 31, tied with Stone. Zadorov's 26. Good Branson's 29. Valimaki's 23. Stone, like I said, 21. And 24 is Shillington. Like, the fact that Hannafin is 24, he's one of these guys, when I think back in my head, I can't remember a season before him. Like, yeah. he just feels like an elder statesman in the league, doesn't he? Yeah, and it's one of those things that, um, like, having a good strong defensive core like if you were say like valimaki does emerge as a top four defenseman having a top four of hannafin anderson shillington and valimaki like that if all four of them are playing at the level they are and assuming valimaki joins the upper trio like that's a really damn good defensive group and for like a decade from this point See, and I think right now part of the reason Shillington is looking good is he's got a veteran part. Oh, I agree. So I don't know. I'd put Valley with Shillington. I think you'd put Valley with either Good Branson or well, Zadorov. Well, uh, no, of course. Like, I'm talking like a year or two from now, like assuming Valimaki takes those next steps. And, okay. Yeah, you know, that kind of thing, not like today. But And, you know, we, we have to be honest. The way Zadorov plays, he's going to be out of the lineup soon. Oh, yeah. Like, that's what he's brought in to do, and he does it well, and there's going to be an opportunity there. The question is, do you give it to Valimaki or Stone? And right now, I think you got to give it to Valimaki. Yeah, and especially against, like, teams that are quasi-rebuilding, like Montreal and Ottawa this week. I think those are the type of games where the opponents have a lot of young, faster forwards. Valimaki makes a lot more sense in those games than you know it, a team that's a little bit on the bigger side like san jose where you know a guy that can hit is a little bit more valuable yeah and i could even i am just looking at the the next week of games i guess a couple weeks i could see uh, valimaki against buffalo i could potentially see valimaki against the islanders um, i just think that they've got some forwards there that he could do well against and also like you said, Montreal, not a great team. Ottawa, not a great team. Like, guys that you might be able to build some of that confidence against. Exactly. Like, even if uh, you deploy Valimaki against those 
type of players, like, the odds that he's going to do something drastically wrong that costs the team is going to be minimal. So, you know, you want to hope that he gets some confidence in his game. Did you think we'd be sitting here on November 10th talking about Good Branson being in the lineup and Valimaki being out? Like, this just seems like totally the opposite of what I expect us to be talking about. Well, Good Branson, when he's utilized properly, has been effective at what he does. For sure, yeah. but I just kind of expected he was being brought in to be that number seven guy. Yeah. And I thought that lineup spot was Valley's. Uh, well, I figured that he was going to be the number six, and Zadorov might be the number seven, even though he's getting paid more. Yeah, I guess that's true. I would say Shillington's probably in what should have been Valimaki's spot. Yeah, and it's just one of those things that you kind of just have to reward the play on the ice and, you know, everything else be damned. And, you know, good Branson, that, you know, I like honestly at this point, like, if this is what Good Branson is, can we resign him for another three or four years? Like, that mm-hmm. that's how good he legitimately yeah. has been. One point, $1. point nine million. You don't give him a raise, but I bring him back at that. Well, with how he's played, like, even if you gave him two and a half, three, that's not out of line. So, like, it, it, that's, you know, he's been really good. So, it's one of those things that... And who knows if he'd even want to come back, or this is this is a show me pay me season. Yeah, exactly. But you know, it's one of those where like he's quickly becoming a pivotal part of this defense core. Which you know, when we signed that contract, I think there was probably zero people who thought that. But I didn't think he'd be pivotal, but I wasn't as upset about. No, as neither was I. But it's one of those that like he's really found a niche with Sutter and I think that his style and Sutter's mesh so well together. And I also think he's in the right spot in the lineup. I think, you know, previously he was maybe playing too high up in the lineup and we see that a lot on bad teams. Yeah. Right. We, we see guys that are maybe being pushed up higher than they should be Mm -hmm. in the lineup because they're the only guy or they're the best guy at the time or things like that. And I, I think, you know, maybe where he's, you know, where he should be is a bottom three right now. He's older. I don't think he necessarily has the um, – I, I don't know that he should be playing in your top three, and I think this is probably where he should be, and he's excelling in the right role. Yeah, and I think that, like, if you can keep him, like, as he is, and, like, if in case of injury boost him up in the lineup, he can – sort of like when Giordano went down that one year and England had to – go on the pairing with Brody like he was able to do that and he played yeah. well and I think for short periods of time that like if we needed to have good Branson as a, a number two or a number four we could get away with that for a while because mm-hmm. like especially with how well he's been playing he could do that it's just that yeah. you don't want him to be forced to do that which thankfully our team is better than you know needing him to be a number two number three number four guy i'm just looking back at his career he started in florida and then vancouver i think he's probably played accurately in the lineup on those teams i think pittsburgh maybe is a little bit higher than he should have been anaheim definitely and then ottawa i mean he was playing top pairing for ottawa wasn't he yeah i think so and then he went to nashville and he was sort of another piece there that was sort of a a rental deal Mm -hmm. um but, yeah, I would say that, you know, he's probably should be, like you said, that that guy that you can move up if you need to, move up in a pinch. I think him and Tanev would be a fine second pairing if we need to for a couple games, two veteran guys. Yeah. Um, and, and, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if, if he we make him an offer stick around. I don't know if he'll want to stick around, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if they make him an offer. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And we'll see. Uh, like, we saw how it, it was a huge impact to this team with when Derek England came aboard and you're seeing a lot of that same stableness with uh, England or good Branson um, thus far and hopefully as the season continues you don't see him his game fall off the face of the earth but I don't see that happening just due to the fact that it's him and Sutter basically you know, a match made in heaven. Like, Good Branson basically plays Sutter's system 
exactly naturally. So it's like, uh, oh, you want me to do what I'm comfortable with? Oh, gee, that's tough. <laughs> You want me to and go you know smash what? that guy? Okay. <laughs> well, and at the end of the day, I think if Good Branson gets overtaken by Valimaki, nobody's going to be upset. No. Like that's what we want is we want the progression from that young player. Yeah, no, and like even in years past, like when it comes to the preseason, you have to be better than Matt Stage and for like a number of years, or whomever the veteran guy is. And a lot of times, the young guy just could not beat that, and that's fine. It's just you know, it's better to have the stable veteran guy there. This year you've got yeah. both the high and the low. you got to be better than Stone. Yeah. And then better than Good Branson. So if you're not even as good as Stone, we're not going to look at you. Okay, now you're on the roster. Now you got to be better than Good Branson. Yeah. And we'll see how it continues. And, you know, full marks to him for his game thus far, and hopefully that just carries on. A friend of mine was at the last uh, game, the San Jose game, and he said he saw a guy at Fanatic getting a good Branson jersey made. I said that may not be a, that great of an investment. We'll see. Well, I, I could see that. You know, if you're a fan of his genre of player, I'm sure that guy also has a Derek England jersey. And, you know, I'm sure yeah. a Derek, a Darren McCarty jersey from years gone by. So That's a good point. I just thought, wow, that's that's not a great investment if you're looking for a long term jersey yeah. to have. We'll see. Or or maybe he's one of these guys. I, I saw a guy on Reddit last week who said that he collects all the. I, I forget what number it was. It was like every player has ever worn forty for every team. That's his favorite number. So he's just a bunch of forty jerseys. So maybe this guy's some forty four connoisseur. Yeah. I can't even think of other. You'd have what him and Warner. I'm trying to think of other forty fours. Oh, I know there was one other guy at least. Oh, what the heck was the guy's name? <laughs> you can tell he's important. Yeah, it was... Oh, jeez. I want to say it was Ed Ward, but I'm probably wrong. I think Ward was uh, 47. Here, I have it. We have nine players. Jonas Hoagland, Rico yeah, Fatter, Hoagland Rob was, Niedermeyer. Hoagland was the guy I was thinking of. Rob Niedermeyer, Re Warner, Aaron Johnson, Stefan Meyer, Chris Butler... Matt Bartkowski, and now Eric Goodbranson. Hoagland was good. <laughs> Rob Niedermeyer was, he was okay. good for what the team needed yeah. at the time. He was okay. I mean, you got to remember where the team was. Probably the worst of those was Chris Butler. Uh, Stefan Meyer was pretty terrible. Actually, Bartkowski was pretty bad, too. Yeah, a lot of those guys were bad. <laughs> so it's like I'm just looking here to see if there's any number that's never been worn by the Flames when I'm on their all-time numbers list. Oh, there's quite a number of the upper ones that haven't. Uh, not as many anymore. Most of the 70s. We go from uh, 70 has been worn in 77, but nothing in there. And then 78, 80, 81. So most of the 70s haven't been, but there's a lot more guys that have worn the higher numbers now. Yeah. Um, and, of course, uh, 66, that one uh, preseason with TJ Brody. Didn't he wear it in the regular season, too? I'm not sure. I think he wore it for about four or five, ten games in the yeah, regular season. I just remember hearing a lot of Pittsburgh Penguins fans just being absolutely pissed off. <laughs> the, how dare you wear Lemieux's number? It's like, I didn't pick it. I don't care. Uh, he, he was assigned it. Yeah. Yeah. Rabble, rabble. <laughs> That's right. Um, well, I, I won't go too far down Sweaterland because I could be here all day looking yeah, at uh, here. looking at guys and what numbers they've worn and that sort of thing. Why don't we take a little bit of a side trip and let's talk about some of the players in the AHL. I don't want to talk too much about some of the college or Canadian or European because some of those leagues are still getting going. But why don't we look at how some of our Flames are doing in uh, the AHL? Yeah. So, Walker Dewar's the first guy. I'll go alphabetically here. Walker Dewar's the right winger they signed. Looked really impressive in camp. And he's actually now back up in Calgary. He's been re-signed but hasn't played yet. And he's currently played five games in the AHL. Two goals, one assist, three points. Um, he is, I would say, I'll be honest, doing better than I thought he was going to do. Yeah. Well, he's looking basically like uh, Garnett Hathaway like that genre of guy, just a decent, hardworking, third, fourth line guy, and he's big. 
So, like, I, I you know, talking about He Darryl, seems like he's a guy who knows his role. You yeah, see a lot of these guys that come in and want to be more than they are. Yeah, and he seems very much like, a, I'm a Daryl Sutter player, so I'm going to play Daryl Sutter's way. Let's go smash some people. And you know what I thought when I first saw him play? He's what Keenan Kanzig should have been. Yeah. Right? Like, we kept Kanzig around probably longer than we should have. Nice guy, but we kept him around longer than we should have because he was big and they're waiting for him to do something. Yeah. And I think like with Kanzig, uh, it was more foot speed than anything. But, um, yeah, no. And there was, like, how would you say? You can be big, tough, and fierce looking, but if you're not fierce inside and like having that intensity like it, you're not going to have success and Dewar has looked like he has that it, level of intensity where like he can rise to the physical grind game if need be and you know he looked rather good in the preseason I'm not shocked that he's up again uh, I wouldn't be shocked if he got a game or two frankly uh, just to give him a cup of coffee in the NHL level just for his own good. Because uh, I, like, I think this will be a player for the Flames for the next few years um, in much the think, way that like when the Flames signed Hathaway, like he played for a number of years after that. And I think it's your same story, basically. And I think with some of the teams we're seeing, like San Jose and Ottawa, are being decimated by guys on COVID protocol. I would not be surprised if when we go on a long road trip, we start calling guys like uh, Doer up just to be those bodies if we need them. Uh-huh. Yep. I think that we're we're seeing that now. Of we should probably have some extra guys kicking around. Not as much when we go to the states because it's a lot easier to pull a guy up from Stockton. But when we're, say, going on a road trip across Canada or even on the other side of the country in the States, I think they're going to want to bring those bodies with them. Yeah, I can see that. Um, the next guy here is Ryan Francis. Sort of had an interesting um, journey this season. He spent a lot of time in the NHL and the AHL, both the Flames camp and Stockton camp. Got four games in in Stockton. He had no points, and now he's back in St. John. Uh, or, yeah, the St. John Sea Dogs. I always mix up St. John and St. John's. Um, and he's got five points in four games. So a guy who started in the A, I would say from what I saw there, probably not ready to be there. So I think right move to send him back to the queue. Well, I think that he, like much like with Wolf and those guys last year where they were only up until um, training camp for the junior leagues uh, started, I think that yeah. uh, it was much the same way and um yeah that's true because i don't even think he's 20 yet so he couldn't have stayed up yeah and then the next guy is glenn got the last cut from flames camp um he is looking good this week point per game three game three points in three games he's got eight points total one goal seven assists and six games in, in the hl i think this is really god year to either break out or get up. move on yeah. like I, th- I think he's that guy who and there's one every year is too good for the hl maybe not quite good enough for the NHL, and I think this is his year to really show that he can be too good for the HL. I don't think the last couple of years he's been that. I think he's had that potential, but then this is his year to show he's the star in the A. Yeah, and it's one of those that, like, if he doesn't take that next step necessarily with us, like, I could see Godin kicking around the league, much in the same line that you've seen a guy like Derek Grant bounce here, there, and everywhere, yep. pick a bad team, and he plays on the fourth line, and you're good. Yeah, I think, and I think either pick a bad team or he's that guy that everybody's bringing in to be that 14th forward, first call-up guy. There's a guy you can see moving a lot on waivers during his career. Uh-huh. But, yeah, I, I totally agree with you there. I think uh, I think that this is his year to either make it or break it within the Flames organization. Yep. The next guy on the list is Jan Kuznetsov, the defenseman. One of the few defensemen that we have in Stockton. Um, He's been a steady presence so far, searching for his first pro point. He's played eight games with no points so far, which doesn't really surprise me about Kuznetsov. That's not really his game. Yeah, he's a defensive defenseman, and he's huge. So, basically, uh, Keegan Kanzig, who can skate and play. And then the next is Connor Mackey, probably the best defensive prospect we have there. I just think with the defensive depth we've got this year, the Flames made the right move to send Mackey down to get playtime. Yeah, 
And frankly, like, next year, like, I can see them not re-signing Zadorov necessarily, or having Zadorov play Good Branson's role, or just bring Good Branson back, and then have Mackie and Val Mackie on the team as well, and... Yeah, yeah, I could see that. Or maybe no, I was gonna say maybe they get rid of Stone, but that's never happening. No, he's Stone's, he, Stone's gonna be here forever. He's set in stone here. Yeah, he's a foundational piece, you know. You know, in uh, in Star Wars, when they have Han Solo in the Carbonite, that's what we're gonna have the new rank. It'll just be like Michael Stone in the in the Carbonite, so yep. he's there forever. Yep. <laughs> After he retires, we'll set him in Carbonite, and be like, "Hey, Michael's still here." Yep. 60 years um, from now. Hey, Mike, how's it going? That's right. He'll, as you come in the door, he'll just be there greeting fans on their way in. Need a defenseman. Grandkids, <laughs> his grandkids will go visit his uh, his Carbonite bust. Yep. You need a defenseman and to play tonight? Just unfreeze me, then freeze me after the game again. <laughs> and they'll probably end up on the Flames team. Because, like, well, you're his kid, so you're automatically on the team as well. Yep. Um, Connor Mackey, quiet week by his standards, played a ton of minutes, and he's getting a ton of minutes there. I mean, he's the best defenseman they've got, but no points this week. And I think I think for this guy, we're, again, with Mackey, I don't know you're looking for a lot of points. I think Mackey is more of a defensive defenseman, and I think this is a guy who's going to be moving the puck around. You're going to get a lot of assists from him, but I'm not looking at him to put up many goals. Yeah, more of like... And his, not even getting a lot of first assists. Yeah, more of like if you're looking at a comparable more like tj brody where he'd get like five or six goals in the season and like 40 assists that more of that level of breakdown like if he pans out and all that kind of stuff jacob peltier the left winger i would say probably the most interesting player to watch in stockton so far and we're going to try and get our our friend from last year or from two seasons ago stockton's finest on to chat with us but uh peltier has probably been one of the most productive rookies and really reliable so far he's played in eight games has two goals seven assists nine points um this past week he played in three games with two assists and two points so I think, again, Pelty is a guy that I don't want to rush up here. I know fans want to see him, but I think you've heard my thoughts, Matt, for years on how I think that we may have rushed Bennett. And I think Pelty is a guy with the depth we've got on the left wing. I'm okay to maybe even over-ripen at the HL level. Yeah, same like with Zari, uh, same with Coronado. Like, I'm, you know, like, frankly, the Flames, especially because they're in win-now mode, like, they they don't really need guys coming up trying to cut their teeth at the NHL level. And well, and if you look at them, where's he going to slot? Like, we have, what, Goudreau, Kachuk, who's technically the left winger, Coleman, Lucic, so what, you're going to take Richardson slot? I'd rather you play in the end. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it's one of those things that, like, the Flames have a lot of good young players in the NHL level. That's good. And, like, especially, like, as, like, cap issues start to happen... You, you might have to see a guy like a Monaghan or a Bennett or a Backlund, I mean, or a Lucic have to go. Well, then you have a good young player that you can fill that spot with. And, you know, like over the next two, three, four years, you're going to need guys like Peltier and Zari and Coronado to fill those spots, but you don't need them now. You don't even need them really next year. So it's, you know, and see how he does. And, you know, force them to you know, break the door down and say, yeah, I'm ready for the NHL. Put me in the top six. I'm going to go score 25 for you right now. Yeah, but I think you want to do that as opposed to just, well, he's the next body up. Yeah. And at, and at that point, I think I think there's this notion a lot of times that let's just bring up the next best guy. But And you've said a lot on the show, let's bring up the guy who fills the hole we have. Don't say, well, he's the best guy. We'll put him on the fourth line. There's guys you bring up like Walker Dewar who are going to be that career fourth line guy that you put on the fourth line. Yeah. Well, and, like, I tend to take a look at, like, successful teams from past eras and forward and see, like, what did they do. And, like, Detroit was successful for, like, decades because they allowed guys like Yuri Hoodler to play in the A until they were 22, 23, 24. Uh, Datsuk didn't really get full-time NHL minutes until he was 24. And, like, then once they were actually able to get into the NHL, they were able to take those upper minutes and run with it and become those impact players that they were because they didn't need to figure things out at the NHL level. Like, their game was already ready to go. And, 
that's why they were successful for a long time. And I think Calgary, especially with having a, such a young group of forwards and defensemen, they can, and like a stable goaltender, like you, you don't need to rush Wolf up, you know, right away, that it allows that lead in time to allow everything the more space it needs in order to properly. And I think there's been this fascination in the modern NHL with young players, partly because they're cheap, but I think there's a lot of also teams that when you're a first or second round pick, it's sort of implied that you're going to make the NHL next year, which I don't think you always should be. No. And I think that and I think that if you can, not even Detroit, but I even look at teams like Tampa Bay recently and that sort of thing, who they know when they can keep a guy in their farm system. Well, you look at like and, the New York... And there's Ra- not that need to bring them up. Yeah, you look at like the New York Rangers, right? And they drafted Capococco and they drafted Alexis Lafreniere, one and two. Great prospects, great young talents. And they both look freaking terrible at the NHL level because they were rushed. And it's just the same with uh, Jesse Pugliarvi in Edmonton, who is just finally starting to round into a good NHL player after like three, four years of being terrible, frankly. And, you know, like, oh, he's like uh, Ole Olivi level bust for, you know, up until pretty much this time last year and you know it's one of those things that like teams rushing guys just because oh they're the shiny new toy is not always going to be the best thing and you know it, yet other times players can work with it like Lucas Raymond in Detroit is, who's looking like a superstar already yeah. And I think the other thing to remember is that not every young player can be the superstar. You need some guys that you bring up to be the reliable bottom six guy. Mm-hmm. And here's a guy I think could do that, and that's Emilio Pettersson. He's one of the older guys in the team. He's a left winger. If they're bringing a guy up just to fill a bottom six role, I think he might be one of those call-ups. Yeah. Um, he's got two points so far in the season. Got one this week, but I think, I mean, there's not a guy you're looking at a ton of scoring from. What do you think of Matthew Phillips, though? I mean, there's another guy who is, I think, the oldest or one of the oldest guys there. He's had a few looks of the NHL, but I'm honestly getting the sense from Phillips that he's almost one of these guys who's too valuable at the AHL to get called up, if that makes sense. Like, he's a good, reliable AHL player that makes everybody look better. I almost get the sense of the Flames almost look at him as, we can't afford to bring him up because there's a huge hole in the AHL. Yeah, and frankly, the Flames haven't had an injury to a top six forward in a long time touch That's touch true. wood um and like you're not gonna want him playing on a line with Lucic. It, no. it would be funny you know because of the size discrepancy <laughs> hey together you make two average size humans but <laughs> you know um <laughs> it's like know. in the in the movies when they have you know two kids standing on each other's uh shoulders they could put the two of them on each other's shoulders with one jersey on them. yeah exactly um but you know, and and I think I think Matthew Phillips' size is a big part of it. Yeah. we also have a, a quite a small roster if you look around the league, and yeah, I think that he's gonna have to come in to fill the right hole. Yeah, and you know, like if say like Manjapane or Gaudreau went down, I would expect Phillips to get recalled, and like the lineup being shifted upwards, like say like Eat Bread taking Gaudreau's spot, and then you know Phillips taking Eat Bread's spot, and going from there. But, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, if Pitlick goes down, you're surely not going to get Phillips in there. Like, it just does not make sense. But again, if that's kind of his role, like, how long can you keep him around as that insurance guy for that role before he wants to try his hand somewhere else? Well, I think that's where, like, the Flames, over the course of this season, like, they've basically marinated him in the oven long enough where... He needs an actual shot at the NHL level at some point. And I think he could make a roster for a, a not-so-good team. Yeah. And I even think he could make this team, frankly, even now. Well, I just think but, the size is the biggest yeah. reason he wouldn't. But Yeah. It's one of those that, like, would you play him every game? No, you pick your spots. Like, you know, like if you're playing, like, a bad team or more of a passive team where, you know, the physicality is not important, 
then, you know, throw Phillips in there. But, you know, if you're playing a bigger team or an intense game, you're going to want, you know, a bigger body guy in there. And that's where you're going to have to manage minutes until he establishes himself as an NHL player and then you just run with him. But, you know, ease him in. Yeah, I think, he, I think he'd be a good 13th forward somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, the next guy is a guy that you and I were kind of fascinated by when they brought in from the U of A, I think, was Luke Philp. He, we never knew how he'd really look as a pro. This is a guy I honestly thought would spend a lot of time in the ECHL, but he's got four points in eight games. Not as good as he – he had a really good season last year, if I remember. Yeah. Um, so, you know, probably regressing back to his mean. But, again, a guy I don't think he'll ever be an NHLer, but probably a, a, he can make a good living playing age of hockey. Well, like, even when we brought him in, like, the main comparable we had was Derek Ryan. You know, which, if he evolves into Derek Ryan... I don't think... That, I think that, Derek Ryan got lucky. Oh, I agree. But, you know, it's one of those, like, if he can evolve his game to be that kind of guy, then great. Will we see that? Probably not. But, you, you know, benefit of the doubt. And I think, like, the Flames will probably end up giving him a cup of coffee at some point. Just, to, like, like they do with everybody like that they sign from college ranks. Regardless, they always seem to give everyone at least a game. Unless, like, they're bad. And the last guy we'll talk about here is the current lead scorer for the Stockton Heat. And that's Adam Rajishka. He's, uh... The fourth round pick in 2017, he leads the team with 11 points so far and one of the top producers in the AHL this season. He's played in eight games as seven goals, four assists, and 11 points. And there's this tendency to bring up your lead scorer uh, on the A to give him a cup of coffee. I'd be perfectly fine if they leave Rajishka in the AHL. And there's other guys we need to figure out what they are before we worry about Adam Rajishka. Yeah, like Rajitska is one of those guys that he could fit on any line pretty much in the NHL level it's just a matter of it making sense uh, for his development more than anything like he's the main draw on him drawback on him uh, has been his consistency game to game shift to shift and like the talent was readily apparent right from the get go and like if the consistency was there he probably would have been a first round pick it's just that... And that's another reason I think you should keep him there. I think yeah, you're exactly. You're going to lose that consistency going up and coming down and going up and coming down. Yeah, exactly. And, like, when you're ready for the NHL, you're going to be ready for the NHL. It's just, you know, you have and to get your And he's the guy they got to be over-ripened. Yeah. And, like, I would not expect him until he's, like, 23, 24, 25, just because of the fact that, like, you have to be good consistently, shift in, shift out. This is who you are. We can plug you in, and you can go be a wrecking ball in the second, third line and have fun. And you know, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, you know, and like he's a big guy, he's six foot four, strong. You know, his game is of a similar style as of Genny Malkins, where he, he uses his size to like push things. So you know, it's one of those where if he can do that consistently, then great. But, you know, he has the consistency is number one in Paramount. And I said he's the last guy. Let's look at the goalies, too. The Flames have two goalies down there, Adam Warner, who they brought in as a free agent this year from Colorado, and Dustin Wolf. obviously. Wolf's continuing a really strong start to his pro career. He started twice, won twice, and he's among the top leaders in pretty much every AHL goal cal- category. And Warner uh, started once. And he won that start, which is really all you can ask for from your backup is when he put you in, have a good game. Yeah. And um, Daniel Chechelev is also hanging out in the A, but not playing. But uh, Yeah, I didn't really mention him because there's not much to mention there. Well, I, you got to throw the bone at, hey, I'm uh, I'm here too. Yay. And <laughs> I exist. <laughs> da- Daniel Chechelev eating the buffet every game. Yep. Hey, free, f- um, free food. What more can he ask and not for? Only <laughs> the, not only the Calgary Flames off to a hot start, but so is the Stockton Heat. In the Pacific Division, they're second. They've played eight games. They've won seven and had one overtime loss. So no losses in regulation so far, which Stockton's never been a great team. No. So that's really good to see. Especially like, frankly, from the Flames a- farm team, like right from the get-go in like 2005, 
when like they started finally like getting the farm teams consistently like they've always been kind of terrible but i think that's true to form of i mean the flames have always been sort of a middling team we've never drafted number one the years we did draft high we screwed it up with fata and kachuk and guys like that like there's this whole period where you know, you, you we can kind of write it off as good farm teams. And now we're sort of getting these 15 to 25 picks. So I think they're kind of doing about as good as you can expect them to do. But for a roster, I would say is not a lot of really good guys, especially on the blue line. I'd say sort of a lot of spare parts on that roster right now. Um, I'm surprised to see they're doing so well. Well, and I think a lot of credit has to go to the goaltender for their hot start. Like Dustin Wolf has frankly looked amazing down there and yeah uh easily one of the top goalie prospects not only for the flames but in the nhl in total he's probably one of the top five goalie prospects so you know uh it's one of those things that you know a good goalie that's you know kicking butt (laughs) that uh is the big equalizer yeah, I've uh, I've heard really good things from people about Mitch Love as a coach too, and I think that's probably helping out. Is is that maybe coaching change there? Yeah. And then the other thing to note about them is Connor Zari has been hurt since training camp. He's been on the Flames uh, RF or U, um, IR list, so he's now back in the HL and is expected to make his start tonight on November tenth for that team. So if Zari joins, I mean, that's even more firepower there. Yeah. And it'll be interesting to see how the season goes for Stockton. Um, and you know, it, it's nice to see like, uh, after so many years and uh, like, I think that one of the main features, um, with Stockton being so good is just a testament to the scouting staff of the Flames because of how many of the mid to late round picks. A lot of those guys are deep picks. You know, uh, like Wolf was a seventh round pick, Ruzitska's a fourth round pick, Phillips is a sixth round pick, Pedersen's a sixth round pick. Like, you know, like a lot of the those guys are way down there in the draft, and yet they're playing very impressively for Stockton. So hopefully, you know, like especially as we move forward, like, guys like Beck who's kicking some butt in juniors can k- carry that tradition of being a good late round draft pick forward and you know keep the farm team doing excellent for years to come I agree and before we get to sort of our uh, wrap up from last week let's talk about the Hockey Hall of Fame this weekend that's something we talk about a lot as Flames fans the 2021 induction class is Doug Wilson Kim St. Pierre, Kevin Lowe, Marion Hosa, Ken Holland, and our very own Jerome Ginla. I wish I had Beasley here to say his name, but uh, we don't this week. That still gives me chills when I hear it. Uh-huh. Iggy going into the Hall of Fame and going in so fast after his retirement for a guy who never won a cup. Uh, good for Iggy. Yeah. Well, you know, like I was looking at like era adjusted uh, goals for in NHL history. And, like, Ovechkin and Maurice Richard were one and two. And Jerome McGinley is actually the third best goal scorer in NHL history, adjusting for wow. the era. Like, that's how impressive McGinley yeah. was throughout his career. And, you know, very unheralded in a lot of ways. And it was disappointing that he did not win a Stanley Cup. But, like, there are few players that are more deserving of a Hall of Fame nod than... Jerome McGinley. I agree. And and I think it's, I mean, just thinking about the two, I mean, look at who he's in there with. Doug Wilson, right? And it's taken him how long to get in there? Yeah. Marion Hosa. I would debate if Hosa maybe should be in that class. Kevin Lowe, I mean, a huge part of that Oilers team, but just going in now. And Jerome McGinley. So I think, you know, looking well, at... Well, even you know, uh, Hosa, like, didn't he score over, like, 600 goals in his career? So, like... Or something like that. Like, he was a very good player. Yeah, I, I would just never look at him as being as key a cog to any team as Jerome. It, well, he did win cups, though, so I think that's the equalizer on that. Yeah, that, you're probably right. Like, he was never kind of your number one guy. No, like, he was always, like, that guy adjacent or the guy that yeah. is your guy, that's the guy he passes the puck to. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> so, but I'm, you know, but I mean to be in there with uh, Lowe and Wilson, very impressive. And for you yeah. know to be in there, I would say so much sooner after retirement than those two guys as well. Very impressive. Yeah. Well, frankly, like over the last thirty years, there have only been a small handful of like truly elite players. It, yeah. And again, was one of them. And in. When I saw this list, I was honestly surprised Lowe wasn't already in. Yeah, same here. Like just because of the the you know the Oilers team that he played on, I kind of expect he already would have been in. Yeah, like if Glenn Anderson on that team is already in, like you kind of expect. Yeah. But yeah, no, and like well, frankly, like again, was in the like that same tier as guys like Joe Sackick, and you know. Brendan Shanahan, Steve Eiserman, like he's of that caliber of talent. So he the is. fact that he is like first up, you know, right in right away, it, yeah, uh, it would be just like it would be shocking. Like if you didn't induct Patrick Waugh right away, like it would have been a shock if Aginla wasn't thrown in right out, like instantly. No, that's yeah. You're you're right. He's very deserving. I guess I just when I look at this and I look at the players in with, I I think the one thing I wish is even if it wasn't here, I wish that he would have hoisted a cup. Oh, for sure. And and he bounced around enough after Calgary that I think he was trying to do that, and he just never quite got the right destination. Yeah, I know. And you saw you've seen that in the past with a couple of guys like Dino Cicerelli and. Uh, uh, um, Marcel Dion, where like they were elite players for a long time, and they never were able to either. And yeah, yeah, you know, it's you know, it, like especially as like this league has evolved from like a fifteen team to a twenty one team, now a thirty two team league. It's getting harder and harder to win that know, cup. Like it, it, the importance of winning a cup in your career is less important really like it i think it is stats wise but i think that's that's why every every kid plays this game they want to hoist lord stanley's mug yep i don't know that i'd say it's any less important i mean you know when you when you're playing the game on the street i know when we were kids we'd get our mom's dishes and we'd wrap tinfoil around them and you know skate around on the inline skates with that that's why we play this game oh i know the other thing the other thing I found kind of interesting is I was I was uh, watching last week at the Kevin Lowe uh, retirement ceremony, and it's like it almost felt like Cuz Lowe's going in, they retired him, but we honored Jerome well before he was going in. It just felt like almost a snap reaction in Edmonton to, oh, Lowe's going in. We should probably honor him now. Yeah. Oh, yes. Right. Not just, wow, our, you know, one of our best players ever is retired. Let's give Jerome that honor. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. The other thing I found silly, I don't know if you watched that ceremony, the Oilers players sat on the bench with masks on, then 20 minutes later they came out to play without the masks on. They weren't anywhere near the VIPs. Who are they going to infect? Each other? They're going to do that during the game. Sometimes rules are there, and it's like, this makes like, no sense. I, I talked to somebody, and they said, well, they weren't actively playing. I said, no, but we're not. We're allowed to wear the mask when we're, quote-unquote, actively eating, but that doesn't mean I have to put it up between bites. Yeah. Right, like I would say, if you're if you're on the ice surface, in which I would include the benches and the penalty box, you're playing. Yeah. So, well, I, don't know, just, um, I, f- I, I, I think kind of that um, a lot of that is exposure time, and like if you're on the ice, you're not really you know hanging out with the guy that you're with for very long. Yeah, but you're still in your. I don't know. Are they wearing the mask in the dressing room? I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean, you're gonna get just much exposure time there. Yeah, it's very odd. Well, let's uh, let's wrap up by talking about the sole thing, pretty much that we talked about last week, and that's Jack Eichel. We spent our whole show on Jack Eichel, and we've never had a show become so irrelevant so quickly. Less than six hours after we stopped recording and talking about will Eichel come here, we had our answer, and he went to Vegas. Yeah. So, Matt, looking at the package that uh, Vegas gave up, are you disappointed that he didn't come to Calgary? Are you thinking we could probably beat that? Uh, well. The package itself, and in the end, do you think Calgary was ever actually in the running, or were they just there to? No, I, sort of I, be, I be think the foil? that the Flames probably did offer a better package. It's just not, you know, what it seemed like was that 
the ownership in Buffalo did not want to spend the money uh, that you know anymore, and the five million dollar savings that they got with the Vegas side, where Calgary had to give back basically the full amount. I think that was the difference, and you know, I I think that it, the Flames probably offered the better package, but were done in by Vegas getting around things with the uh, injured reserve loophole mm-hmm. stuff, and you know, uh, what? And it's going to be interesting to see what Vegas has got to do when their guys get healthy. Like, there's going to be more movement there. Uh, well, th- they are in Vegas. You know, you could just hire somebody to break some kneecaps. <laughs> Almost the I, I used to use this joke about Rick DiPietro. They signed one of the biggest deals ever, and then he happened to get hurt. Like if I had that much money, I'd probably hire someone to take out my kneecaps too, so I'd keep the ten million. Yeah. But yeah, no, it's one of those that players injured. What's the injury? Bottom of a lake, <laughs> both upper and lower body. Yeah. <laughs> body injury. Concrete shoes. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I, I I think I think you're probably right about not wanting to spend the money. I also wonder too if sometimes new is more interesting. We've heard for a long time yeah. Calgary being in on Jack Eichel, and I wonder if there is a little bit of that. You know, we've talked to these guys for so long that after a while it just gets annoying. And do we want to talk to Brad again? Somebody new comes in, and it's almost like, wow, they're new, they're more exciting. Let's go that way. Yeah, and, and I think too. I mean. If you listen to the Jack Eichel interview that was done right afterwards, they asked him, where did you think he was going to go? He didn't say Calgary. And I have to think more than we know, the player probably had some say in this as well. Yeah. And, well. Like, guys don't want to come to Calgary, especially young guys like that. And I think the whole Canadian market, sort of that, you know, we've heard that sort of Canadian um, market stigma. True, but um, yeah, it, he's a New York kid. He's always played in the states. I think that I think that may have had something to do with it. Now, if Calgary's a better team, he might have. But I think right now it's like, why go to Midland, Calgary, when I might be able to go to more successful Vegas? And I think he probably had more of a say in it than we think he did. Yeah, uh, and you know, it, is it disappointing that the Flames didn't get him? Definitely. And, like, you know, frankly, like, this was a 1 in 15 year opportunity, just like the Joe Thornton trade. That, like the Thornton trade, we were runners up on. And, you know, it's one of those things that has kept Calgary, frankly, as a middling team, is that they haven't been able to get that marquee guy and like even though they're successful frequently like they're still not able to add that whatever piece to get you know and they're not bad enough either to draft that guy either and uh, that's where like they're kind of caught in no man's land but at the same time i mean we've seen other teams let's say edmonton go out and overpay for that guy and you could say they did that this past summer as well so, at what point do we just have to say, you know, we just have to let our performance bring those guys in? Oh, I agree. And, like, that's why, like, if the Flames, like, as the season goes on, like, you can see even now that this team is lacking one guy that's, like, a good top nine forward. That's, like, your solid 20 goal ish guy. Just, like, as an additional uh, weapon. And,. You know, like, if the Flames go out and get that guy at some point during, between now and the trade deadline, and whether it's as a rental or it's a, more of a permanent thing, I think that'll be important more so than necessarily than getting Eichel. Like, they do need, like, that, and that was part of the reason why, like, getting Eichel was so important was that you know, like, not only is, like, this a really premier player, but he's also would fill a need. That need is still there, and if they can fill it with somebody, obviously, who's not as good as Eichel, but somebody good regardless, I think that will be the important thing. 
I was a guest on the hockey podcast last week, and we were trying to find some of those names. And the issue we came up with is most of the guys you'd want there are no trade or modified no trade. And again, I bet Calgary would be on a lot of those lists. So I think Tree would have to get kind of creative in who he brings in there or how. And, and I think if we're successful like we are now, that's going to speak for itself. I think a lot of guys, especially near the deadline, would wave to come to a playoff team. But if we're yeah. not or we're hardly in, I think you're going to have to get creative in who you bring in because I bet a lot of teams would have Calgary on their NMC list. Yeah. Well, and that, that's the thing. Like, the Flames need to get creative and, like, not necessarily going with younger players. I, you know, and, you know, like, there's one player that I thought would look great for the Flames for a number of years, but I haven't really brought it up because it, it logistically didn't make sense. But now it's starting to, and that's Anze Kopitar. You know, because L.A. is kind of rebuilding right now, and his contract is coming to an end soon, and, you know, he would definitely fill that second-line center spot perfectly, frankly. And, well, yeah, I think it would before cost. you bring in that guy, though, you got to decide who you are. If you're a playoff team, you oh, bring in sure. the veterans. If yeah. you're not a playoff team, you got to fill with the young guys. So I think we have to figure out who we are first. Yeah, and uh, like th- this is under the presumption that like what we've seen and like how good the Flames have been through each of the 12 games, that carries on throughout the season. And like they're a good upper tier top five team throughout the season and like okay let's add um and like go for it and you know like um it, it's just one of those things that uh because you can't get the young guy who's like the premier superstar in Eichel uh, you know getting that like legit top six forward is still a need and I, and I know. think you've kind of got to target the 20, 29, 30 year old guy for that instead of the over 30 guy. I think you've got to sort of go with that. You know, we can't get young, but especially if we're going to invest multiple years, I'm not sure I want to go Kopitar age. I got to see how old he 34. is. 34. So I'm not sure I'd want to invest in that for more than one year. I think I'd much rather go with a guy who's, uh, you know, 29, 30, even 31 and do a two or three year deal on that. Yeah. Well, like even, uh, like, specifically with uh kopitar like um he kopitar's a great rental that's about it yeah well like he has 15 points already this season which is very good and you know like that's where you know like thinking outside the box because like uh, of course somebody that's 34 you're like oh that's a little long in the tooth but you know like it just depends on who and how much the cost is like a, if the cost well, there's the two acqui- costs there there's the acquisition cost and then the ongoing cost yeah and that's where like if the numbers all make sense and that like you know like if the flames were able to go get Jonathan Taze that'd be perfectly fine okay so so i mean we don't want to go too far down this road but just very quickly what is a reasonable acquisition cost for Anze Kopitar uh probably um well I would assume that LA would have to eat like two to three million just because he makes ten um, for the next like three years. Uh, but you know, a first plus a good prospect and a cap dump of some sort. Okay. I I don't want to get into a Kopitar debate today. I think that's a little high for me. Yeah. But I can I can understand, especially if you think that this is your year to go for it, where that package could make sense. Yeah, like. Uh, how would you say, like, um, under the assumption that, like, say, Monaghan, like, at the deadline is not playing well, that would be your cap dump in this situation as part of that deal. And, you know, it's one of those where if Calgary wants to, it, it's sort of like how the Toronto Blue Jays have, they've got a bunch of good young players like Guerrero in that, but they've been signing a bunch of guys, like, over the last couple seasons and have become a really good team. The Flames are, they've got the good young guys. Now they need to get some good 
secondary parts to this team to well i think they're doing that better this year now with a lot of these veterans they brought yeah. in they have in the past i agree like coleman has been fantastic well even outside of coleman i think you know you look at lewis richardson even the guys we were talking about earlier yeah. was a door off good branson like just enough they're plugging the holes with vets as opposed to plugging the holes with tweeners yeah and like even if you get you're getting guys like when the flames went out and acquired owen nolan like, you know, you knew that that wasn't a long-term thing, but, you know, he was a really good player, played the, that year with the Calgary really well. Jeez, I forgot that Owen Nolan was here. You know, and then he went Sounds on. Sounds like a lot of guys have been here for a cup of coffee. Yeah, and, you know, like, it, Calgary is, I think, at that competitive stage where they need to look at getting a guy or two that's, like, has been a guy who's kicked butt in this league that's long in the tooth that they can pencil in and he's going to still be good enough. Like how yeah, teams I don't, have I rented don't disagree. a game I just think the cost is what you got to ask. Yeah. We didn't pay a first and a prospect for Owen Nolan. No, we just signed him as a free agent. But, yeah. you know, it's one of those things that, you know, it's sort of like when the Penguins rented a Ginla from us. You know, like, yeah. You know, Calgary might have to do something along those lines. But I think a rental is very different than bringing in a long term on Zay Kopitar. Oh, I know. And that, like and I don't everything. Think we can really afford, as much as you might want a guy like that, we got two big contracts to resign. So I don't think we can afford to do anything more than a rental this year. Oh, time I know. At it, the big dollar value. And that's where, you know, like age stage and all the details matter. But, you know, it, it's just. It, an interesting thought experiment, especially as this team moves forward and, like, how to take Calgary from being, like, assuming, like, this level of play continues, taking it from that to, hey, this team could actually win the Stanley Cup. And, yeah. you know, it, because you have to look at with Daryl and his influence on the locker room and the ages of certain parts of this team – that it's going to get long in the tooth and, like, you're going to have to lose a guy that's good in order to keep the rest. And, you know, like, sort of like how Tampa's had to scale back significantly. Calgary's not that far away from having to do that kind of a thing. So, you know, it's kind of like a now or, you know, not so much. <laughs> so, you know, it'll be interesting to see, especially moving forward, like, if Calgary plays at that upper level to make it so like, hey, we might actually do something level. <laughs> well, let's talk more about trades as we get close to the deadline and move through the season. But this week, let's talk about the four games that we have in front of us from here on out. Yep. The Flames uh, finish their homestand. They're now on a, what, two-week, we got how many games? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven game road trip. Um, but four of those are going to be this week. So tomorrow on Remembrance Day, the Flames are in Montreal, a 5 p.m. Mountain Time start. The next night, they're in Toronto for a 5 p.m. Mountain Time start again against the Maple Leafs. Don't play Hockey Night in Canada this week. One of the few Saturdays they don't play a game. And then Sunday is a 3 p.m. Mountain start in Ottawa. Uh, and then Tuesday night, a 5 p.m. Mountain start. So all really early games this week in Philadelphia, and those will be the four games for we talk next, Matt. So Montreal, Toronto, Ottawa, Philadelphia. I'll give you my predictions for this week. Yeah. Uh, I think that we lose Toronto and we win the rest. Okay. Um, well, way to steal what I was going to say. Uh, <laughs> I Actually, you know what? I'm going to go back into bad habits and go four for four. I, I, th I do. Four for four being four wins yeah, or four, four losses? four wins. I Calgary has been consistently in your face in each of the games, and how would you say it? the Western Conference teams tend to be built a little bit more resilient to that level, that type of game, um, and that's part of why I think that the Flames have not had as much success thus far against the Western teams, but the East, like, you you saw against, like, the Rangers or the last time we played the Flyers, like, they just kind of got overwhelmed, frankly. And, like, with Montreal and Ottawa... And two teams on this are going to be easy to overwhelm. Yeah, like, they're bad to begin with, and, like, if the Flames are 
continually playing that, you know, in-your-face, all-game relentlessness, you know, like, all four of those teams are going to have a hard time beating Calgary, so... Yeah, uh, yeah, I'll go four I, I for think, four. I think Toronto's the one team that I, can... I was going to say that, but you, know, yeah, you stole my line. Yeah, I think they're the one line, team so. that can do it. Yeah. Um, and, and I think they probably will do it. And I just, I don't know. I think Toronto's got some to prove right now. Yeah. And I can see them doing that also against a back-to-back Calgary Flames. Yeah. And I think... Where do you think Dan Vl- Vla- Vl- Vl- Vladar plays in these Vladar four? Markstrom, Vladar Markstrom. So you go Vladar and Montreal, for those that don't have the schedule in front of them, Markstrom and Toronto, Vladar and Ottawa, and Markstrom and Philly. So you split the two? Yep. Interesting. I think after that San Jose game, Markstrom could probably do to sit for a game. Not that he did anything wrong, but I think maybe you sit him down and and it's a good time to switch goalies. Yeah. Uh, well, You don't want to switch him when he's hot. Well, like even then, you're like the 3 o'clock start because it's an odd start you're going to see Vladar in that game regardless. Just yeah, but because... I mean, you don't put Vladar in after, say, a 6 nothing win against the Rangers. So if you're going to put him in, that 4-1 to loss makes sense to swap. True. And, you know, um, Montreal's bad, so it makes sense. Just, uh, you know. And... Well, and I think there's – I'm not a goalie. You've played goal more than I have. But I think when you look across the ice at who's there, I think there's some intimidation factor. If you looked across the ice and you saw Carey Price there. Yeah. But, you know, it's Jake Allen. So it's like, yeah. You know, you're not against a really good, even in Toronto, you're not against a really good goalie on any of these teams. Carter Hart's the best goalie of these four. Yeah, and even then, you know, so it's one of those where, you know, Calgary, yeah, they they, they have a good shot. And I think that managing Markstrom's ice time it, I think will be a good thing this week, especially because like the next week they're playing a little bit higher quality of opponents through the four. Buffalo. Yeah. <laughs> well, n- not them specifically. The Islanders and oh, the Islanders in Boston. That's yeah. what you mean. Okay. Well, you know the awesome team that is the Buffalo Sabers. Yes. And, and then Chicago, which is becoming a big mess of a team. I'll be on, and we won't talk a lot of trade, but we'll talk about it as we get close to that one. I think if you're going to do a deal, there's guys going to want out of Chicago, yeah. and that's the team that's going to have guys jumping ship soon. Yeah. Um, if anyone needs a goalie, I bet you get Flurry out of there. Oh yeah, I think it'd be like here, just take him at this point. Well, I think there's just a lot of guys that are going to say, "Get me out of here!" Yeah. Like I'll go anywhere. I'll even play in Edmonton. Get me out of here. Yeah. Hey, Edmonton, you can actually get a legitimate starting goalie. All it will cost you is... <laughs> a first-round draft pick. A non-player, because nobody wants to come here. Even for Edmonton, it's not like they do anything with their second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. They give them a second, they wouldn't miss yeah. it. Uh, by the way, uh, speaking of Marc-Andre Fleury, his mask for Chicago is one of the nicest masks I've ever seen. And it, Just Google it. It's black with yeah, it it's stellar. So, yeah. I I haven't seen his. He he's wearing like the retro uh, brown pads, right? I think so. Yeah, he is. He wore those sort of gold pads in Vegas. I always thought were too gold, and now he's got like retro, almost brown pads in Chicago. It's uh, it, it's a different look, but I think it works well for an original six team. I hate it when non-original six teams think they're original six and go with like the laces and stuff but yeah I think it works well for him I did like Flurry's mask in Vegas that had the actual gold like shiny crown on it that was pretty cool yeah uh, but we will do that as our homework we'll all go back and, and look up Flurry's Flurry's mask for next yeah. week I'll actually if, drop if that you... in the link for you just to make it easy on you if you want to comment on Flurry's mask or your thoughts on if the Flames dodged a bullet, uh, knock in Eichel, or if they missed out on the deal of the century or whatever it is, give us a phone call. We have a new line this year that you can call. You can, of course, get to us on Twitter. We're at Fireside Podcast. On Facebook, we're Facebook.com slash Fireside Chat. Or call our voicemail line, 403-768-2121. We have a 403 number this year, so it's easy to remember. Again, that number is 403 768 Two one two one. I promise you, we won't pick up. You don't have to talk to Matt or I, but leave us a voicemail, and we would love to play your thoughts on the show next week, or hit us up on social media. Mm-hmm. You want to do your thing, Matt? Well, as always, go Flames, go, and 
Fox, you suck. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.